Hello and welcome to this week's review and it is a review. This review comes courtesy of a gentleman named Paul Mitchell. Now this is Paul Mitchell and you may remember or some of you may remember Paul Mitchell as the Mitchell bit in Mitchell and Johnson who sadly closed their doors a little while ago. They were selling amplifiers and CD players and highly regarded they were as well. Low in price, pretty good performance capabilities across the board. So it's good to see Paul Mitchell back in the saddle as it were and he has arrived toting a pair of powered speakers. speakers are known as the Ustream ones and they retail for £499 and you can pick them up oh, all over the place, Amazon and the like. The unique selling point for the stand mounted powered speaker design is the Ustream's wireless nature. They offer and I quote true wireless stereo Bluetooth technology to connect to each other with no connecting cable. So what does that mean? Well, normally when you have a pair of powered speakers, the speakers themselves are connected by a simple cable just like this one. So what Mitchell Acoustics is saying is that, well, they're getting rid of this thing, which means that speaker placements can be a little bit more free and easy. Now I've just started to talk about cabling and all that jazz which means I can feel an aura of techiness coming about me. I reckon in that case we need to take a closer look. And welcome to the closer look section for the Mitchell Acoustics Ustream 1 powered speakers, wireless no less. These 8 ohm speakers each weigh 3.6 kilograms and include drivers based upon clarity and apparently proprietary technology. Now the manual and the website present this particular brand name slightly differently. I've gone with the website variant here. Mitchell boasts about the included heavy neodymium magnet set which is aimed to produce, and I quote, outstanding low frequency, unquote, response. We'll see and hear more about that later on. The speakers themselves are pretty small at 150 millimeters by 235 by 230 millimeters. They include a 106 millimeter mid base driver with a magnesium alloy diaphragm. Just above that you'll find a 38 millimeter magnesium alloy tweeter which is also based upon the same driver technology with a composite dust cap although the manual doesn't mention that. In between the two you can see a little circle. This little circular thing is a receiver for the included remote control. Inside is a 50 watt Class D TPA 3116D2 Texas Instruments amplifier. Bluetooth is in there as well and that has a range of 10 meters. Let's look at the rear of the speakers now and on the rear is a rocker power switch, there's a USB port but this one is reserved for software updates. 
You'll also find an optical port and there are a pair of RCA inputs, an auxiliary input and a barrel power connector. Now each speaker has its own mains cable and that's thankfully rather long. To begin the installation I unpacked the speakers and the presentation here was rather nice indeed. The packaging looks tidy and professional and I was faced with a pair of mains cables using a switch mode power supply with a breakout cable at the end of both to accommodate various territories. The US has its own cable as does Europe. UK users need to plug the Euro cables into a nicely sturdy three prong adapter plug. The UK adapter incidentally is an excellent option and one I'm a little bit unfamiliar with I must admit. It feels rather solid and secure. It's a superior option to the usual solution of adding those rather flimsy plug prong variants onto a small rather fragile looking single chassis. So once your territory is sorted cable wise the breakout cable is plugged into the end of the power supply box. The completed power supply cable combo is then plugged into the rear of each speaker via one of those dinky barrel plugs. And then you plug each speaker into the mains. The first unit that is plugged in will be the master and the second unit will become the slave. So when you control the master speaker the slave speaker will also be controlled identically and simultaneously. The speakers give you two control options. You can control the speakers via a small handheld remote control or via each speaker's built-in control panel which resembles those rather cheap and cheerful credit card sized remote controls you often see in low-cost audio equipment. Here though the control section is implanted actually in to the cabinet of the speaker flush into the top of each speaker. You get two in all one for each speaker. Now I have to say that the control response for these built-in controls was rather sluggish and clunky during use. You have to keep each button pressed for a second or two to gain a response which can sometimes result in you pressing too many times and overreaching yourself. For example let's say you've just pressed the M button that's the source mode button and then you find no immediate command response. Now if you're of an impatient nature that might trigger more impatient presses which means that you'll probably skip past your desired selection which will cause some frustration I'm sure. The solution? Take these controls slowly and pause for a moment before pressing again to see if there's actually a response on the way. Even so for this price point I expected more quality from this area. Oh and by the way that response is vocal so if you actually input a command apart from the volume that triggers a vocal confirmation. So if you press the mode button you'll be verbally told if you've selected Bluetooth auxiliary in, line in via those RCA sockets or optical. The rest of that toppermost control section also allows you to increase and decrease the volume. Now you're supposed to get beeps when you press the volume going either up or down but I didn't hear any I must admit. You're also able to turn on or off each individual speaker using this control panel and by the way if you leave your speakers on for anything more than 15 minutes these speakers will automatically switch off. There's also a play and pause button and there's also a true wireless stereo button that's the TWS button you can see here and that pairs the speakers together. Again you'll get a vocal response when pairing is completed and Bluetooth pairing is pretty simple and quick. I had no issues there. Now we'd normally go straight to the sound quality for this next bit but before we do that 
Let's take a quick look at the manual. Now there's a few points I'd like to make where the manual is concerned and I consider the manual an extremely important part of any setup for any hi-fi components and it's also an essential reference during use. Now the first point I'd like to make regarding the manual is a mistake that I made and it was a mistake which involved the remote control. So I set up these speakers and I grabbed my remote control and I was pressing the buttons on the remote control and nothing happened and I thought the remote control was faulty so I changed the battery in the actual remote it's one of those little button batteries and nothing happened so I called the company and I said what's going on and they said what I needed to do was to remove the little tray from inside the remote control I needed to remove the button battery and flip it over and then install the battery and push that tray back in the remote and all should be fine. Now, why did I need to do that? Well, what happens is obviously Mitchell Acoustics are shipping these wireless speakers hither and thither and they're sitting on warehouse shelves and there's a threat obviously of the battery draining. So I can understand why they did this. However, however, first up to ask a new user to risk their fingernails to pull out the rather finicky hard to shift battery tray on the included remote and flip a battery is one of the more well inelegant methods of jump starting a remote control I've ever seen. I much prefer those well I don't know if you've ever seen them yourself I'm sure you've had them yourself those little remote controls and at the back there's a little dangly piece of floppy plastic and you pull it out and when you pull out this little dangly floppy bit of plastic from the little door then the battery is formally connected to the remote control and it's working. I find this Ustream method of battery flipping clunky. Secondly the battery flipping instructions are listed at the bottom of page 15 of the manual. This is just before the troubleshooting area at the rear of the manual, way after the parts description, way after the initial setup instructions and the feature descriptions and more. Now I must add at the beginning of the manual in the quick start area there is, I must admit and I hold my hands up, a big bold black line which says before you use the remote go to page 15. But why? At that point the manual keeps the reason rather a mystery. Why even ask you to go to page 15? If you're in the quick start area why not just tell you there and then? Why not tell you about the battery flipping exercise there and then? Why not show little pictures of the action required the pulling out of the tray and the battery flipping why not do that why have this rather inscrutable bold line saying go to page 15 and knock on the door and ask for joe why do that why do that now look this is my job i skimmed through the quick start section and i missed it so what happens if someone who's installing this and thinking about what to get for dinner that evening or it's time to pick up the kids from school. What chance have they got? Probably next to none. Now, as I've mentioned already, Mitchell Acoustics really go a bundle on the true wireless stereo thing. This TWS is the main selling point of this particular package. But the thing is, the TWS moniker, the TWS acronym, actually sparked two pet peeves of mine in this manual. The first is repetition. Why on page 9 of the included manual is there a floating caption right next to the picture of the TWS button? 
And it says, get ready for this, it says TWS button. So let's pause here and appreciate this moment, shall we? There is a picture of the TWS button in the manual. And right next to that picture of the TWS button is a caption which says TWS button. Secondly, the true wireless stereo headline term is not connected to the acronym TWS until page 18 of this 25 page manual. Before that, the TWS acronym is mentioned in the text and via picture form around nine times inside. I counted quickly, I may have missed one or two. But it's mentioned nine times or so before the acronym TWS is ever actually explained. So, rule one of writing a manual, never assume. If you want to prevent confusion and thoughts of ill will floating towards your company, you never ever assume that people will know what an acronym actually means. You never assume they know anything about your product. You explain it the first time it appears. Mitchell commits that cardinal sin here nine times. The manual, which is full of little irritations that add up to a big pain, was obviously not proofread. Really, a professional designer needs to be employed instead of giving the task to the guy who delivers the sandwiches at lunchtime. But hey, let's put the manual behind us, shall we? And instead, let's ask the essential question. What do these speakers actually sound like? Let's go to the sound quality section and we'll find out. To begin, I decided to test the basic sound quality of these speakers. Well, what I mean by that is I want to go straight for the jugular on this one. I want to see the capabilities of these speakers. I just want to see how far I can push them in sonic terms. Now, at a glance, and that's all I'm doing for now, this product seems to be aimed at users who are looking for a pair of power speakers that prioritize ease of use over and above everything else. I get the impression that a lifestyle market is the target audience here. What I mean by that is I get the impression that these speakers are aimed at an audience where pure sound quality is maybe second on the list and ease of use is the main squeeze here. Now, maybe I'm wrong and probably I am wrong, but this is why I wanted to tackle the core sound quality now, just so I know what I'm dealing with here, just so I know what sort of products are we looking at here. So I hooked up a modded Astell & Kern AK120 to the back of the speakers connected to the optical port and pushed through three tracks. Two of them were 24-bit 96k and one was 24 bit 88.2 just to gauge the sound from a relatively high end perspective. And you know what? None of them worked. Not one. First time I heard a sonic response was when I fell back to 24 bit 48k. So I guess there's some playback restrictions here restrictions that the manual does not talk about. So I asked the company about this and yes, it confirmed that 24-bit 48K is the limit of the optical port. So I selected an intriguing track. This is a jazz vocal. It's by a lady by the name of Carol Kidd. The track I selected is called How Deep Is The Ocean. It's produced by Lynn, Lynn Records, that is the Lynn record label. This is a very high quality recording and it has a wide dynamic range. Now this is a laid-back vocal jazz piece as I said it includes percussion, there's an upright bass in there, 
there's piano and acoustic guitar. Let's start from the bottom up on the sonic scale, shall we? Let's begin with the bass. The thing is though, this recording has a pretty wide dynamic range, which is why I chose it as a test track. That is, whatever high frequencies there are, go pretty darned high, while bass frequencies push way down low, further down than even some rock recordings I can mention. So here the upright bass response pushes its bass through the floor. It's not big or window shaking of course, but it is present and it is rather weighty. It's also offered a dynamic range that the Ustream speakers seemed to struggle to cope with in its entirety. I actually heard bass breakup distortion right at the lowest end, and the small mid-bass drivers found it difficult to cope with the wealth of information on offer here. Now, Clarity might be the name of the mid-bass driver, but to be honest, I wasn't hearing much clarity during this sound test. Bass was actually rather squelchy and lacking in structure. The additional problem with an uncontrolled bass is that it tends to negatively infect the mids and the treble. It tends to veil the finer upper mid-range detail and just pulls the ear away from any delicacy you might hear from the treble. Now I did a quick comparison in this troubled area with a pair of powered speakers, wired powered speakers I may say, from XTZ. These are called Tune 4s and they are priced at around, well, they're half the price basically. And the Tune 4s proved a solid and capable pair of performers, offering a meaty bass performance. They were easily able to cope with the extended dynamic range from this Carol Kid track while providing a relatively solid and organic playback for the price, while never really encroaching on the mid-range output at all, or dispersing any of the fine detail from the treble-infused cymbals. So, in terms of the Mitchell acoustic U-streams, the music itself was the problem. It was asking too much from these speakers, so I changed the music. So I opted for a relatively compressed disco single. This one is from Yabra and Peoples, and it's called Don't Waste Your Time. Here, the Ustream was better able to cope. Here, bass offered impact and strength, but because of the compression on this track, all of the music's inherent frequencies were being corralled. So basically what I'm talking about here is that the earlier Carol Kid track had a wide dynamic range. Now, the Ustream couldn't cope with that. So offering a more compressed track where the frequencies are squeezed into a smaller space, shall we say, the Ustream found that task, well, more acceptable. Even so, playing this compressed track through the Tune 4 speakers from XTZ I never felt the compression was accentuated. There was plenty of space for the music to roam and listening fatigue was quite low. Compared to that performance, the Ustream's upper frequency performance did cause slight issues. Mid-range was a little bit edgy and rather clinical during vocal crescendos, percussion strikes and upper frequency synth lines while the treble was just a bit tense and rather stressed. I also brought in the Canto YU4 wired powered speakers, again, just for some comparison. And again, these speakers are priced around half of the Mitchell Acoustics Ustream ones. And again, I thought the YU4s offered a superior overall sonic presentation here. Playing the Yabra and People's track through the YU4s, you could hear the sense of compression, but the degree was not as high as the Ustream presentation. 
there was a little bit more balance from the YU4s. But look, I'm criticizing the Ustream's wired performance. And as I've already said, that's not the headline feature for this package. This is a wireless performing pair of powered speakers. So let's test the sound quality in wireless mode, shall we? So I squeezed a 24-bit 176.4 kilohertz track by Keith Greeninger and Diane Kai through a Bluetooth stream. This is a dual guitar, dual vocal track with plenty of space surrounding both artists. Now the Ustreams performed a lot better here in this wireless configuration. Of course, you've got a Bluetooth stream and Bluetooth inherently is okay. It's not the best source in the world. What I mean by that is the lower quality of the Bluetooth stream was suited to the Ustream speakers. Even so, when compared to the YU4s, the vocal performance was a little bit constricted and clinical. The guitars from the Ustream offered a focused and precise performance, although the compressed nature of the presentation did reduce the space around the soundstage a bit. There was none of the rich nature of the guitar that I also heard via the Tune 4 speakers. The Tune 4s provided a relatively rich and full playback, while the Ustreams tended to sound a little thin, a little bit forced when the volume was pushed. This vocal effect also occurred when I changed the music to a Grand National album. The track Drink to Moving On at 16 bit 44.1. Now this track is already compressed as it comes out of the studio. The percussion was already edgy right from the get-go, but the Ustreams, well, they accentuated that effect. The Ustreams added to that tension while the bass was, well, a bit chrome-plated, resulting in listening fatigue before the song had even ended. Compare that to the Tune Force performance, which was relatively open and relaxed around the mids, with an expressive and sparkling rhythm guitar and a powerful yet well-integrated bass response. So what have we got here? Well, the Ustream's wired and wireless performance, they both sound a little stressed, a little bit tense, especially at higher volumes. Now, that's despite the relatively large size of the actual speaker cabinet, especially when you compare these speakers to its immediate competition. From what I could see after this series of tests, the problem I saw was that the Ustreams were having difficulties filling a room, filling a room with music. Asking the Ustreams to fill a typical listening room with music was putting too much strain onto its prospective performance. Basically, these speakers were falling over. I tried the Ustreams in a near field configuration. And what does near field mean? Well, literally, it means putting the speakers close to you on a desk or somewhere similar, relatively close to your ears. And that means lowering the volume. And I listened to the Ustreams in this configuration. And finally, finally, the Ustreams stood up and gave a performance. I gave them a restricted dynamic range track from a lossy version of Marvin Gaye's Mercy Mercy Me in that near field configuration over Bluetooth and at a lower volume, which is a long-winded way of saying I didn't ask them to work too hard, and the Ustream speakers sounded rather nice indeed. The speakers took this restricted sound format, inserted space in between the instruments, provided an open and spacious soundstage, and sounded, for the very first time, relatively relaxed and at ease with the task in hand. For the first time, bass had some structure and some control. The rhythm guitar offered a range of information. The lead vocal actually used emotion within its delivery. Instead of sounding harsh, saxophones sounded suitably reedy. 
there was no flabby bass and treble sounded pretty well behaved. Now these upper frequencies didn't sound particularly mature but they were certainly very presentable. In fact in near field mode I actually preferred the Ustream 1's performance to the YU4's. It struggled to cope with the performance from the Tune 4's from XTZ but it made a good fist of it nevertheless. In addition to that the Ustreams are obviously offering good connectivity options and there is that added flexibility of the wireless design. That is a cable needs to hook onto each of the YU4 speakers and the Tune4 speakers to work at all. The Ustreams did not need this which means that speaker placement for the Ustreams can be wide and varied while the speaker placements for the YU4s and the Tune4s well despite the connecting cable being pretty long there are ultimately finite places you can put the things. So what I'm saying here is that basically there are no placement issues for the Mitchell Acoustics Ustream 1s. You can put them anywhere in your room whereas you can't do that with the Tune 4s or the YU 4s. Ultimately even though that connecting cable is fairly long you are restricted. There is a finite amount of places you can put those particular wired speakers because of this connecting cable. So with the Ustreams you can be rather imaginative about where you put the things. That might be a big part of your buying decision. Playing the Grand National track in near field mode was a chalk and cheese experience. Now that the Ustream wasn't being pushed too hard the bass sounded full and relatively rich. The vocal performance included more texture in its delivery while secondary percussion was visible to the ear. That is instrumental separation, the gaps in between each instrument was richer in effect with vocal harmonies being better integrated. So how do you solve a problem like Maria? I mean how do you conclude a review of the Ustream speakers? It's a bit of a roller coaster this one and that's for sure. Nicely presented in terms of build and packaging the Ustream speakers when pushed hard tend to fall over in sonic terms. They complain when you ask them to fill a typical listening room with music. The only reason I can see to buy these particular speakers is for near field use or because of that essential lifestyle feature the wireless design which means you can place these speakers anywhere you want to in your living room, in your bedroom, in your kitchen, in your office or wherever you may wish to place them and you can put them in any old place. They don't have to be in a classic stereo configuration. They can be up above and down beyond and wherever you fancy. In short then if you're looking for a pair of hi-fi quality speakers with Bluetooth feature to fill a typical listening room. Don't bother with the Mitchell Ustreams, they will fall over. But if you need a low volume near field wireless design for a small room environment, desktop or in your face operation or for more imaginative lifestyle speaker placements then these Ustream speakers are feature rich well appointed these are niche speakers and if you need to scratch your niche check out the Mitchell Ustream ones. And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for staying to the end of this video and thank you too for your continued support. It is much appreciated and on that basis if you haven't already done so if I could ask you to click on the like and subscribe buttons below I'd really appreciate that too.
Check out the description below, shows lots of social media links, which I peruse, and also my Facebook group link, which you're welcome to join. There's a link to my website, which has a whole host of information you won't see on this channel. And of course, there is my Patreon page. Now, there is an early bird video option on my Patreon page. So if you sign up for that, you will see these videos before everybody else on YouTube. You will get a early bird exclusive, which will give you at least a couple of days of watching before it turns up on this YouTube channel. There's also some exclusive material on Patreon. It's all good stuff. Check it out. I'll be back next week with another video, and I hope to have your company then. Until that time, folks. Bye-bye for now.